Hey, on this podcast, one of my favorite topics, and this is going to be the four factors for sizing up your idea, your deal, or your company that investors look at, and also how to think and talk in the language of money. Let's get into it right now. Hey guys, welcome back. Oren Claff here. Of course, who else would you have on the Oren Claff project? So today, just back from Mexico, took a long vacation there, which was amazing, and a resort called Vedanta. Check it out online, Vedanta Grand Lux. Very cool. But I'm just wondering something, like why, so flying to Mexico, you know, it's funny, I pay for my seats, because they call on Friday and they go, can you be in Mexico, uh, you know, in a resort on Monday? So I gotta buy seats. I gotta buy a seat for myself, uh, in business class because I don't like to get there tired. Uh, uh, and so I got to buy a seat for my little boy. He's five. I don't think he's ever sat in coach because I just like him to sit next to me. I don't mind him sitting in coach. And then I got to buy a ticket for my wife so we can all sit together. So that's, you know, six, seven thousand dollars of tickets. Uh, and one thing I noticed is like a lot of the people sitting up there in business class, they obviously didn't buy their ticket. And I don't know how it works. I don't know how to use points. I never use points. But I'm pretty sure. The guy with like uh, two-year-old Adidas sneakers using an iPhone 5 and wearing a, uh, you know, Super Bowl five-year-old, five-year back Super Bowl t-shirt didn't pay for his seat. Someone gave it to him or he upgraded. So I don't know how it works, but it doesn't seem fair. I got to pay $7,000 for seats and somebody else just gets the seat somehow. But life is not fair. And that leads me to the talk today. Uh, which is money. The way money works can seem unfair, right? Why do some people need money for their business and get it so easily? You read it, uh, you know, all the way from Facebook to dating startups to um, uh, data, big data, all kind of trading, eBay, add-ons, all kinds of different companies seem to just raise money like that. And then when you need money, it's so hard. Why is it like that? These things are counterintuitive. So I think about like counterintuitive ways that the world work. Oh, so we're sitting in business class, we're flying to Mexico, um, sleeping, catching up a little sleep, and then uh, they're announcing the landing. I'm kind of ignoring that. I'm wearing headphones. And then the lady walks by and she clicks on my button that makes my seat slam forward. And that wakes me up. Boom! Pop! Seat moves forward, right? Why does my seat have to be put in the upright position? It's one and a half inches. 1.75 inches, doesn't make sense. Why, why does she have to hit the button, slam me, I wake up and I'll tear, like why do I have to put my seat, it doesn't make sense. Am I gonna live if we crash into the ocean because the seat was one and three quarters in? So some things in the world doesn't make sense. And really, the way money is raised is also counterintuitive, counterintuitive. Why is it so hard to raise money? So uh, what I tell people is, the, the first reason is if you're not experienced at raising money, like raising money isn't something that's taught in school. It's not even a subject, like raising money isn't a career. Uh, raising capital, it doesn't even have a name. Raising capital, raising money, securing capital, uh, equity financing, debt financing, MES financing, like there's no, like if you're an accountant, there's GAAP accounting, generally accepted uh, GAAP. Hey Jack, what's the P in GAAP? Principles, thank you. So, uh, so GAP, generally accepting accounting principles. GAP, it's accounting. You're an accountant. You are licensed as an accountant. If you're a plumber, you're licensed as a contractor, sub-licensed plumber. Like, there's no capital raiser, and there's 15 different names for it. You're a subscription agent, a placement agent. Uh, you work in equity. You work in debt. You work in mezzanine. You work in a bank. You work in an investment bank. Uh, you're a you're a broker. Uh, you're a capital, so so it's really confusing because it's not a known profession that anybody teaches. What is your background? You meet people who are capital raisers raising money. They are accountants. They're CPAs. They are sometimes they're marketing guys. Uh, they got a degree in finance. Uh, sometimes they have a master's in finance, but some of them are just uh, technical people. So they have backgrounds in electrical engineering or software engineering. So there's no like one kind of person career that, I mean, if you, even if you get a degree in finance, it doesn't mean you know capital raising, right? So that's one reason it's confusing. The second is the things that work in sales and marketing are exactly what doesn't work 
in raising capital. I've been over this many times, right? But in sales and marketing, you're trying to attract someone and, and then sell them what it is you're offering. So, so it's really hard to sell someone a piece of a company. They have to want it. So the things that work in sales and marketing tend to repel or push away capital. You can't sell to capital the way you sell a product, you sell a service, uh, you sell yourself. You have to attract people to capital. So it's a totally different process. Uh, and if you have questions, you know, I've been through this many times, people say, hey, look, I'm, I'm going out and I'm talking to people about investing in myself, investing in my company, investing in my career, um, funding our charity, whatever it is. And I hear the things, the tactical things they're doing. They're sending out PDFs, they're sending out brochures, they're putting up landing pages, they're going to meetings, they're giving a pitch. And the way they're going about it is the exact opposite from how capital likes to invest in people. Sales and marketing doesn't work to attract capital, but what does, you know, is a really good question. So, so again, the, if you're making notes here, raising money, getting people to invest in you, going out and getting resources in exchange for something, right, uh, in exchange for, for a note or equity in your company is, write this down, is the opposite, usually, of sales and marketing. People who are good at sales and marketing tend to be bad at raising capital. So it's very interesting. That's why, you know, if you're reading Pitch Anything, by the way, if you want to know this stuff and get specific instructions, you order and read Pitch Anything. And of course, the new book, Flip the Script. So Pitch Anything and Flip the Script will lay out the systems and processes for raising capital and sales and marketing and how they're different and how they're the same. And they're much more different than they are the same. So why does money not like to be sold to? So money thinks in a certain way. I know that's weird because you just take out a $100 bill or a check and it, of course, doesn't think. But it behaves, the people who write those checks or give that money out or are willing to invest in you, they think about money very different than you probably think they do. So uh, amateurs or novices or people who don't work in the money markets all the time believe that if somebody has a lot of money, they want to make as much money as possible. Right? I'll say it again. The general belief by entrepreneurs, probably by you, people who don't work in the capital markets, believe that those who have money are just looking for ways to make the most amount of money possible. But that is not true and it couldn't be further from the case. What happens is there are risk reward buckets that everybody who has capital to invest or to loan uh, has identified for themselves. So some people, venture capital, like lots and lots of risk, right? So when you go to them and you, you can't tell them, hey, you're gonna make 50% on your money or you're gonna make 100% on your money. Like you tell me, you bring me a deal and you say, hey, you're gonna make 100% on your money. That, in other words, you're gonna double your money. That sounds awesome to me, right? But I'm not a venture capital firm. Venture capital firms have promised their investors that they're gonna make five to 20 times on their money. So as good as your deal might be, it's not risky enough for venture capital. Now, let's say you move down a step and somebody has worked in a venture capital firm, uh, they've retired from that firm and they're just investing on their own. They don't have the time and the energy and the infrastructure and the deal flow, all terms related to the money business to try and get five, 10, 15 times on their money. So they reduce the amount of return, the amount of money they're willing to make, right? So they used to work in a venture capital firm, they retired, now they're just on their own, right? And maybe they're managing, you know, whatever, $10 million. They reduced their goals for how big of a return they want to get, but they've also reduced the amount of risk they're willing to take. Now they don't want to invest in your hamster dating startup for Facebook that includes poker. Too much risk, too low of a likely. Yes, of course, you know, if it succeeds, you're going to go, billion, go public for a couple billion dollars and you're going to become a billionaire. But the chances of your hamster poker dating app, whatever it is, of actually getting all the way to going public are so low, they can't absorb, they can't absorb that risk. They can't do enough deals to make that risk, uh, to absorb that risk. So now they're not trying to make five times on their money. They're maybe trying to make 25% on their money. And now they don't want a raw startup idea 
about um, how to fix climate change, how to get to the planet Mars, how to get spaceship into the sky more efficiently, how to make a, a, an electric airplane, how to create cold fusion, way too risky, needs too much money. They're not looking for that deal. They're looking for a safer deal, right? So let's say you come to this investor and you offer him this great deal. The neighbors are moving out and you're able to buy their house from them and you're gonna flip that house, right? And so you're gonna buy the house for a million dollars, you're gonna put $200,000 in, and you're gonna make $200,000 on the sale, right? So $200,000 in, make $200,000, you're probably gonna do it inside of six months. Great deal, right? So you offer it to that guy, 100% return. Yes, that meets the kind of a risk profile uh, that he's willing to take. It's a good reward. The problem is the size of the deal is too small. So to take somebody who's been doing uh, big deals for their career, putting in 10, 15 million dollars, um, who uh, now you're offering them a deal that is the right risk and reward, but it's too small. So there's lots of factors that affect why somebody would come into a deal. So just offering them a random, uh, you know, great return on their investment. So you have to understand who is investing the money, what their desire to make a return is, how much return they're looking for, right? What, uh, so what, how much reward they want, what amount of risk they're willing to take, how risky do they want it? So it's all risk reward. Until you understand the language of risk and reward, you cannot offer somebody a deal because you don't know what they're looking for, how much risk they want, and also you have to understand scale, right? You can hit risk reward perfectly, offer them the correct amount of risk. We're doing a, a dating app for grandmas. Uh, great, um, you know, we've, we've coded, we put in $100,000 of our own money, we've coded, we got 500,000 grandmas on the site, um, we are, it's a freemium, and we're making a little bit of money. Okay, so a lot of venture capitalists or investors would like that level of risk, right? Uh, and you hit the reward perfectly, which says, hey, we uh, want to grow this company to 20 million, and then we want to sell it within three years and make three to five times on the original investment. Great. The reward is there. The risk is in the venture capitalist profile. However, there's some other issues, right? Is it a big enough deal to care about? And the space of, like, would these guys get laughed at? in their community if they invest in your dating site for hamsters. Some wouldn't care, but some people do care. Better example is there's lots of deals in, uh, in issuing credit to low, income, uh, to low income families. For some funds, say the Harvard Endowment, the Yale Endowment, the Stanford Endowment, uh, you know, the University of Pennsylvania Endowment, the Carnegie Mellon Endowment, they don't want to issue high risk credit to low-income families. They just don't like that on their watch. They don't believe in that business, right? They don't want those companies to get strung, those, those families to get strung out on credit. So you might hit the risk right, you might hit the reward right, you might hit the size of the deal correct, but it just might not be the taste and comfort level for that investor. So these are the things you have to understand about risk, reward, scale, and comfort level. Get those things right, and you're well on your way to being able to ask for money. Now, within that, there are, are, are sort of buckets. If you think about uh, just maybe a young soccer player or football player, right? There's peewee, then there's, I believe there's mites, right? And then there's grade school, and then there's junior high, and then there's high school, and then there's high school, and then there's junior college, college, and then the pros, and in the pros, there are, there's the European leagues, there's the Canadian leagues, and then there's the US leagues, right? And then there's Africa and that kind of thing. So those are all levels, and it's the same thing in finance. There's levels, if your deal doesn't fit at one of the known levels, as good as your risk is, as good as your reward ratio is, as good as it, uh, the scale is a fit for the investor, the, uh, and, and as good as the topic is, Right, so the four things, if you aren't at a stage that that investor likes and invests in, right? So if you're between junior college and college, 
right? You're not quite in college, but you're too old for junior college. You're just at the stage that nobody can invest in, right? If you've graduated from college uh, and you're, pay, you're, you know, you're played one season in the Canadian Football League and then you're back in the United States, nobody really understands what you are and where you fit. So you also have to fit at a certain stage, right? And most people want to make themselves look bigger than they are, right? But, but investors uncover that very quickly and they can see what stage you're really at. So those are the things you have to consider when you're going out and asking people for money. And, and, and the last thing is you have to know the language of money, right? Uh, so you know, people who sell money to each other say things like, uh, we're going to do a capital stack that is made up of 50% equity, 25% senior, and 25% five percent mez uh, we'd like the equity to mature over five years but are looking for a much longer term um, over the senior equity that would be 10 years uh, with a interest only of five years the mezzanine is going to be expensive you know it's going to be market rate you know something like 14 to 18 percent and that will have a short maturity cycle so even something like that is the buzzword bingo you have to be familiar with to signal to people that you know and are familiar with the language of capital. Nobody wants to give you money if you don't know how to talk the language of money. Okay, lots more to discuss on this subject, but you have to do some things. If you're still here and you're interested in this, then you gotta jump over and join uh, the Instagram, Orrin Claff Instagram. So that's at Orrin Claff. The other things you have to do, of course, are uh, if you wanna see this, and I think it is helpful to see the, the emphasis and the way I'm talking about this, watch this on the YouTube channel that we have and you can see these podcasts. Uh, sign up and share this podcast. If I see like three people listening to it, I'm not doing this anymore, right? This will go over to paid content. You can just pay for it. So if you really like this, share it and we'll do more of it. Uh, so check it out on Orncloud Instagram. Check it out on the YouTube channel, Orncloud Pitch Anything. If you just want to read, this and have it laid out for you word for word. You get these two books and then you don't have to listen to me at all. You can just read it, take notes, and then go do it. Whatever it is, go out and get some money to fund your projects, to fund your ideas, to grow your company. Because I'll say this a million times, I'll say it a million more times. You're either buying or you're selling, but you cannot sit still.